want to welcome you to the Center for Inquiry. The movie that we just saw is one of the main reasons why we exist. And to further deepen our knowledge about this marvelous struggle to defeat the forces of religious dogma, we have three very distinguished guests. I'd like to first introduce the director of the film we saw, Gus Hulwerda. He is an actor and writer known for The Unbelievers, which we just saw, The Girl in the Woods, and The Quantum Requiem. Then, we have his brother, the cinematographer of the great film we just saw, Luke Hulwerda, who is known for The Unbelievers, The Girl in the Woods, and Spat. Gus and his brother Luke are both founding members of the alternative rock band Smokescreen. Sounds like what the religious do, but anyway. Which Gus is the lead vocalist, and Luke plays lead guitar. And now... It is only... Uh, Though I'm a lawyer, I interlope into the realm of speaking and debating on topics of God's existence. And for those of us who try to argue to the general public that the universe is natural and not supernatural, we have a true superstar with us this evening. A superstar, and as we've just seen, a movie star. <laughs> Lawrence Krauss is a theoretical physicist and cosmologist who is professor of physics at Arizona State University, where he also serves as foundation professor of the School of Earth and Space Exploration and director of the Origins Project, which is a transdisciplinary initiative that explores the most fundamental questions of who we are and where we came from. He obtained his PhD in physics from MIT in 1982, and is the author of numerous books. For us this evening, the most relevant of which is the most recent, A Universe from Nothing. And it is a great honor for us at CFI to be able to host one of the true pillars of the scientific struggle to defeat the still very powerful forces of superstition. Please welcome Dr. Lawrence Krauss. Thank you, Eddie, for that f fake introduction, which was really nice. I really appreciate it. it. Made me sound much more impressive than I am. Um, but these gentlemen are wonderful. Didn't they make a good movie? Yeah. Did, did, did. Um, and um, it was really nice to see it in this particular location uh, with this group of people, um, because CFI is a, a great organization that I'm a big fan of. And, um, and so it's a particular honor for me to be here uh, to, to have it screened. Uh, and so I want to thank you all for arranging it, uh, James and everyone else, for allowing us to, to show it here. So I, I'd like to make a round of applause to you all, too, as well. <laughs> but um, let's see. Um, uh, we'll, you, we all know the questions you... will be for Lawrence, <laughs> yeah. and he will moderate. <laughs> Yeah. That's the way it works. The lobby for me, and I'll moderate. And and uh, no, but we'll see. Ask us any questions you want. So now it's time for questions, and Why don't hopefully ask some for Gus and Luke, because no. I'll answer the ones you ask for them too. It's really good. <laughs> Why don't we start out? Just uh, can you just tell us how this movie came to be? <clears throat> Sorry, okay. you want me to tell the long version? Yeah. Okay. Well, so um, I was lucky enough to have uh, dinner with Christopher Hitchens one night after he debated. Um, do I want to say his name out loud? Mm -mm. Okay. He will not be named. This real fucking asshole. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, mm -hmm. He will not be named. And uh, he, he, we, we, he was just, he was that guy. He was the guy he uh, uh, purported to be that, um, um, you know, if you asked him a question after the event, he would go out to dinner with you and spend all night talking. And, and uh, that's what happened. And it was, it was uh, an amazing night. And at the end of it, he said, you know, you're in Phoenix. Do you know Lawrence Krauss? And I said, well, of course I know who Lawrence Krauss is. I don't, I don't know the man very well. Um, he said, well, I have a mission for you. Give him a kiss on the cheek for me and tell him, you know, that uh, I'm sorry I can't be there next weekend. I think that's what the situation was. And uh, 
and I tracked down Lawrence. I stalked him backstage after a show. I didn't actually give him a kiss on the. Well, I don't no, you didn't. Did. Otherwise, we wouldn't be doing this right okay, now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, we, we started talking, and, and I said, you know, what 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 had happened that weekend was or, Origins put on an event, the inaugural event. It was, I think, 12 hours of science uh, in Gamage Auditorium, which is a gigantic auditorium. I mean, who was there that we, weekend? Oh, we had every, well, you know, Richard was there, but, you know, every, there was a, it was a great lineup, and 6,000 people yeah. came and paid to see science, which is something I, I'm very proud of. Yeah, and, and it was, it, Luke and I, uh, we ended up talking about it, and it, was, it felt like Woodstock for science. And we, we just thought, you know, nobody's ever really, I don't think anybody's captured that, this, like, rock and roll uh, thing that that science has going for it right now, this kind of like uh, this fan base that, that people are just so interested in in science and reason, and we thought if nobody's done it, let's do it. Let's make a movie. Let's let's make a rock and roll tour film where we follow these guys around. And it took a while, but, but it took a while because yeah. I mean I remember when I first met you it was outside in the parking lot. Yeah. You were fanboys, and yeah. it was neat. <laughs> and um, and um, and then we over the years we 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 talked a little, and then. Um, and I think you came here to see me lecture in L.A. But, um, yeah. but then what happened was uh, you asked me to be a cameo in, in this. Oh, that's uh, right, yeah. yeah. And, we made and, another movie. And, um, and, I, and I did that, but I was so impressed with the quality of the production that when Origins wanted to have its events uh, filmed and archived, and uh, I asked Gus and Luke if they might do it, and they did. I think the first one was maybe the one with Richard. Yeah. But I was so impressed by the quality that when... Gus came and said, "You know, we should, you know, we should do a film." And we've talked about doing films. And I think, I personally think it's an important arena to go in because people don't read anymore. And uh, um, so we talked about a bunch of possible film projects. And uh, this just happened to come up fortuitously. And three weeks before w Richard and I began a tour of Australia is when we decided to do the movie. Mm -hmm. And in three weeks, these guys got together two film crews and came to Australia and. And um, Richard and I got to fly around, and they got to drive <laughs> overnight to meet us. And it was the beginning, and and um, and of of eight months of of uh, being followed around, 120 hours of footage they took, and um, and it just it was an amazing project. And it would have it w th these guys were amazing, and it it was not cheap to do as it was, but it would have cost ten times more if they if they hadn't spent so much of their own time and effort working on it. And then we were lucky enough. We thought about it, um, about how to do this, and, and we decided to get some friends who are, who are celebrities, who, who are not scientists, uh, to potentially get involved and, and spend a lot of time. Each of those interviews was an hour, and there's a lot of good footage for the bonus DVD. Yeah. And um, uh, anyway, it all came together, and, and it was wonderful that people devoted their time. I donated time. Tim Minchin, who's here, was, we had a great... By the way, he doesn't always dress like that, we, f we filmed him um, backstage. backstage just before he was doing uh, uh, Jesus Christ Superstar in Cardiff, Wales. If you haven't seen it, it's fucking awesome. Watch yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, it was great. Uh, anyway, so that's sort of how it happened. And it was, um, we fortunately enough were also to raise the money in a, in a week for the movie. And um, uh, anyway, it just, and that, that's how it began. That's a long answer to your short question. Thank you, Lawrence. Who's got a question? And please well, we try to keep the questions <laughs> brief. Nobody. Okay, good night, everyone. Uh, oh, here's one. Right Just pass this down. Question for Dr. Krause. Uh, as soon as the cameras were off, did you come up with a snappy comeback that you wish you had told Stephen Colbert? <laughs> No, I, uh, well, you know what, um, I, I had a bunch in my head, actually, but um, he's wonderful, let me just say that. I really, really like him, and I enjoy, it, was, it was a pleasure to do the show. But one of the things you're told is you're not supposed to be funny. Steven's supposed to be funny. And when we sat down, we began, and I told a joke right away, and I thought, shit. But, you know, that's what I do, you know, it just, you know. And then I thought, um, okay, better, better. And then, so I figured, the, you know, since I started inappropriately, I would give him the last word, which I thought would be gracious. So, and I'm glad I did. I'm glad I did. He's, he, um, actually, the it, you guys knew knew this too. I, I mean, I, when you're on stage, you don't know what's happening. But they, it actually went a lot longer. I think he really enjoyed it because uh, the manager kept uh, you, kept saying "time's up" and he kept going on and on. So it was a, it was a fun, um, fun thing. But I think it was much more fun. It was much funnier to give him the last line, and he's really funny. 
Who was the worst person who ever interviewed you? The worst interview? Well, I probably forget all the bad things. So, um... I've had, uh, you know, I've had some... <laughs> I don't know if I should tell you the story. Um, you must, you must. No, 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 it's not really... A, no, no, it's, 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 uh, the, it's, it's just that... I'll tell you anyway, what the hell. <laughs> Because I was telling actually Cameron when we were uh, filming the, the movie, and she agreed because she was on a press tour. That um, writing, doing a book tour, is a wonderful um, training to be a prostitute, <laughs> because you learn how to fake an orgasm, and and you know you because you get to ask the, the same questions at five times a day, and you go, you know that's a fascinating question, <laughs> and and um, so I think it's it's it's. Uh, Usually, though, the worst interviews are actually TV interviews, in the U.S. in particular, be, uh, local anchors, because they're terrified of science. And they are absolutely terrified. They're also worried how, about how they look. So they're asking you questions, and they're playing with their tie and stuff. But uh, so I always, uh, beforehand, I go in and say, it's OK. It's going to be over in a few minutes. It'll be fine. Don't worry about it. But I do find that those are the ones, because when the interviewer is terrified, it, uh, it's hard to be relaxed. You've been in watch some of them. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. Do you have um, any me do oh, memories sorry. from a movie of any? Uh, there were most of, there were some interviews that were done that you didn't that didn't make it onto the movie. Yeah, like that crappy CNN woman, the one who hit Richard and I. <laughs> oh no, it was after the movie's over. We did, that's right. I think remember? that might have been a dream. No, that no, no. Great. It was a bad dream. Don't you remember the CNN interview in Toronto when we were in Toronto? We. Did that CNN interview with that woman who, who basically castigated us for talking about God? Oh, well, there you go. You were drunk. Can okay. I interrupt? Do you remember it? No. There you go. He remembers it. Okay. Let me speak. Okay. Hi. Oh, in fact, that's Here. one. There's a way oh. CNN interview I did when, Richard Do when Christopher died. And there was a, that woman who interviewed me was so obnoxious. And uh, anyway, don't watch it. Yeah, sorry. Go on. Yeah, that's okay. Um, are you finished? <laughs> what was that? Are you finished? Uh, probably not, okay. but you can stop me. No, I don't, I don't want to interrupt you. Okay, actually, I had a question. Um, I guess all of you can answer this. Good. Sure. Um, there was a scene in the film where the atheists were, like, screaming at the guys that were yelling about Jesus, and, you know, they were, like, giving them the finger and all that, and I thought that was a really interesting choice. Um, it really struck me because I think atheists do have this reputation for being very intolerant. Um, so I just wanted you to know. And then there was, after that, Dawkins said something about he wanted to shout the science from the mountaintop. And I just wanted to know where you find the balance between shouting from the mountaintops and screaming in people's faces. Thank you. Well, I just think really briefly, when, when the protesters were there, they were very harsh, and they were, I mean, you know, they're telling people that you're, you know, you're going to die and go to hell, and you're going to burn forever. And so it wasn't like they weren't being confrontational, too. And these people were there kind of having a peaceful um, togetherness movement greeting thing, and it was very nice and polite. And then there's people shouting, and uh, the Muslims were on the other side saying, you know, Christopher Hitchens is burning in hell. And it's just, it, it wasn't as nice as it could have been. It wasn't unprovoked. Yeah, but I mean, we thought. I mean, we thought about whether or not to put that in there. I mean, but you know, we didn't want to. I mean, a lot of people are like, "This movie is just an infomercial for atheism." But I don't know. I don't think it is. I think it shows that we're, everybody's just a person. I think these you know, the people that were there, they got their buttons pushed, and you know, no violence broke out. And we went up to those guys afterwards and said, "Will you sign a release form?" And they're like, "Yeah, man, it's all cool." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, you know, to, to, to be fair, a lot of people said, uh, you know, well, not a lot of people, some people said, well, you know, how come you didn't try and make it more balanced and go, uh, and the point is, and, and Gluss has said it many times, and therefore I'll say it for him, um, <laughs> it's a documentary. They took the footage they had. They followed us around the world, and they, and they took what was there. And, and they didn't go out of their way to do other things. And, and also, you want to tell your line about, about yeah, about it's what, why line, you didn't interview it. other people? Well, we often get asked why we, uh, you know, again, with going along the lines of, you know, this movie is just a propaganda. Um, people, you know, say, it would have been so much better. We got this in the Czech Republic. If, if you would have had, like, a priest and a rabbi and a mullah and everybody could have had an equal say, and then it would have felt more balanced. It's like, I'm like, 
the movie's called The Unbelievers. <laughs> and uh, I mean, uh, Luke has said this, but it's, you know, I'm just sure. going to steal it from you now. Yeah. Say no, no, hold on. I want to steal it. Okay. Okay. But you know, if, if you're, I mean, if you're making a movie about the Beatles, you don't follow around the Rolling Stones. <laughs> did I say that right? Yeah, yeah. you did. Okay, or Led good. Zeppelin. Yeah, or Led Zeppelin. By the way, it's a pity you never, got, I did, uh, my friend Sam's here. He saw that when I was in when I was in um, Davos. I was on stage with a. It was like being in a bad joke with a priest, a rabbi, a mullah. Uh, uh, you know, it was it was a. It, we all went to a bar. Anyway, you guys can make an equal equal movie when uh, Lawrence does the Seven Hundred Club. Yeah, that'll we be can the make day. a whole documentary of that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, a question. Uh, did you ever appear at a location? where there was not a huge crowd. Have, I've done that in my life, yeah, sure. Um, now it tends to happen less often. But, uh, you know, it's like anyone who's, you know, I, I uh, absolutely. And, um, but now it is surpri- it still surprised me. We we're in the Czech Republic last week. It still surprised me that people, you know, fill up auditoriums when I'm talking. And it's nice, it's very gratifying. Um, but I certainly remember, I remember when I wrote my first book, I taught at Yale then, and I was very proud of it. And I, I did a book signing in this bookstore. And the only person that came in the bookstore came up to me and said, where's the bathroom? <laughs> so that was, that, that was a valuable lesson uh, for me. How long was your answer? <laughs> Thank you, Tim. I wasn't trying to entertain him, you see. That was the point. Anyway, very good. Hi. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I used to be a professor of public understanding of science at USF, University of South Florida, yeah. and I use your video, including Tim Minchin's video, Brian's video, all as parts of my course. One of the questions that kept coming up is at the very beginning of your hour-long video, Dawkins says you asked the question, and that's how you guys met. Yeah. And everybody keeps asking, what was the question? Yeah, everyone asked me. Yeah, at the beginning, I, when I, this Universe from Nothing lecture that I gave in L.A., actually, um, Richard introduced me by talking about the first time we, we met, saying that I, I was in the audience and I asked an obnoxious question. And, um, and everyone says, what was the question? I don't remember what the question was. Uh, I hate to say it. I know I, it was along the lines of what we actually talk about in the film. It was along the lines of, because I used to, we disagreed a lot more back then. Um, and I was along the lines of, you know, do, do you really think you're, you're going to be able to convince people by telling them they're idiots the, the first thing, time you, you talk to them? And, and wouldn't it be better to, to take a different approach? And so it was along those lines. I'm an atheist, but I think is what he was talking about. And, and so, um, and, um, and we had a, a discussion. And that actually initiated a, a conversation, uh, which then happened later on uh, in San Diego at this thing called Beyond Belief. And Richard and I had spent the evening debating that issue together over dinner. And then I thought, that'd be fun. And we, and we end up writing a Scientific American article that we drafted, sort of discussing with each other that issue and others. Uh, at the time, I said, my, my approach is seduction, because I like seduction. Um, no, but I think, I think uh, as I often, I it's not in the film, but it's, I often tell teachers and other people that the biggest mistake you make when if you're a teacher is, is uh, assuming your students are interested in what you have to say. Because the minute you do that, you've lost them. What you have to do is reach them. You have to a- try and ask where they're coming from. And I do think that's important, and I try and do that in my lectures and, and my writing. But I have to say, in the process of the 10 years or so that Richard and I have been talking about this, and, um, that I'm much more sympathetic now um, to his, to, I mean, I think we both changed. And you may have even seen it in the time we're together, because, uh, in particular, I think after this last book, and seeing that just asking a question, not, th- not saying anything, just asking the question, can you have a universe without God, makes me a strident atheist. And, and le- realizing that you're labeled as being, and Richard is often labeled as strident even when he isn't being. And that, I think, made, me much, made it much clearer to me that we really do have to work on consciousness raising, which is what Richard has really been doing. So I'm much more uh, sympathetic to it than I used to be. I enjoyed all the, uh, the oh. Oh, sorry. It's all right. He's up front, so why don't we let him say it, and then you can... Okay. And then we'll get you. I enjoyed all the, the cuts of the various celebrities, and I was just wondering, uh, how did you approach them? Were they eager? Were there some people who didn't want to be involved? 
you can start. Well, <clears throat> I mean, it, it, I think, it, if we're being honest, it all started with a guy named Woody Allen. <laughs> and, I mean, Lawrence is friends with Woody, and, um, you know, we, we well, Early on, we, we, we shot most of the film, and, and then we decided, we were thinking about, you know, do we want to intersperse celebrities throughout the whole film and do what everybody does? And um, you know, we kind of decided, it, we wanted this to be that rock and roll tour film that would give you that sense of being on the road with these guys, and it just kind of broke it up way too much when we experimented. But, but the, the idea of having other people who, who weren't scientists, but were, you know, lovers of science and, and reason and these ideas, to speak out about it and give a different perspective. We, just, we thought that was so valuable, we didn't want to not do it. So we decided with the bookends. But in terms of getting the celebrities, I think Woody was one of the first. Yeah, there were a bunch. I mean, uh, frankly, I know a lot, I'm well connected. <laughs> and, and a lot of the people were friends, and we started with those people. And it was important not just to, I felt it was useful not just to try and broaden the appeal of the movie, because there are people who don't know who Richard and I are, but they know who Woody Allen or Cameron Diaz or whatever is. But it was also because it's one thing to hear two scientists say how great science is. But to me, if you're trying to reach a broader audience, it's much more important for people to see their cultural role models talk that people they wouldn't imagine, like Cameron. They wouldn't imagine she's interested in science. And I just, I, to convince her, I told her, I said, you know, this would be great for young girls, so many of you uh, you know, look up to you and, and, and don't realize that you're interested in science and it would be a great role model service and she was very happy to, in fact, very happy to do it. And, and then there were other people who we just simply loved, like Tim, who we didn't know. And we and, and he was very. We, we went to England. I don't even remember why. I mean, uh, it was probably filming. It was, it was probably. <laughs> I was lecturing in London. At the time. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, like we were there because for Stephen. Stephen Hawking. Stephen Hawking. Said Hawking. Oh yeah. Yeah, and and because uh, we went a couple times, but um, but 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 we just put in a call to Tim's management and just begged. And begged. And I never thought it. we'd get through his uh, phalanx of people the, protecting him. The, the people that Tim Tim works with are just they're just so wonderful. I mean, compared to American agents and managers, they're really great people. And um, and and Tim was was generous enough to, to have us backstage at Jesus Christ Superstar, and um, and we did an interview, and it was great. And I mean, I don't even know if you know this, but you know. While we were there, we were also trying to get Ricky, yeah. and we had been working with his manager, going back and forth, back and forth. Yeah, it was I remember just, that. It was always a no, and we met with Tim, and uh, Tim was like, "You want Ricky?" He's like, "I'll take care of that for you." <laughs> He's like, "These guys just want to know you're not assholes." <laughs> and so he put in a call, and before we knew it, we were uh, on a plane to New York, and that's where we filmed with Ricky. Yeah, and, and we and we did, and we wanted to get. I mean, again, people don't understand. Um, that you get the people you can get. It's a documentary. Mm -hmm. And so people often say, well, why don't you have more diversity and, and that sort of thing? And the point is, there are a lot of people, there are people who said no. There are friends of mine who are well-known actors, for example, who said no, uh, because they, even if they agreed, but they felt it would affect their brand in a way. And I respected that. I mean, that, that's their living. And so, um, so I won't say who they are. But on the whole, most of the people, because, because again, except for two or three, there are people we, I, knew, I knew, at least. And, um, uh, or we had people who, who, who would know. I think it was a nice collection of, of, um, of serious people, but people, you know, writers and directors and, and actors. And, and, St and Stephen, of course, we didn't, there are no other scientists either, but Stephen is a, like a celebrity. I mean, he's, a, he's up on that level, and I think it was great of him to do, agree to do it too. The interesting thing about Stephen too was when we did the interview, we said we always bring this, this gray backdrop in, we set up a few lights, and he said, N not for me. I'm going to yeah. be different. <laughs> yes, that's Stephen. He's one of them. Stephen is the most, um, well, anyway. <laughs> He's strong-minded. Mm -hmm. Hello, Dr. Krauss. My uh, wife and I are huge fans. We watch everything we can find on you. Well, one you. of the things that were one of our favorites is the uh, debate that you did in the Islamic Center in Australia. Oh, in uh, Australia. In the, the one that's in, on, in here? Or? Yeah, yeah, the yeah. one that showed up. And one of the most that I'm most proud of is when they were segregating the women against... Well, that's the, that's a, that was in London. Actually, that was a different debate, which isn't oh, in this. Okay. It was a well, much more vicious... This, this guy was a gentle, sweet guy. And I, I like the fact, by the way, I, when I watched it, that, that they... You know, I'm backstage afterward, or not backstage, because there's no backstage, but we're there talking afterwards, and it's friendly and, and, and jovial, but, that, but the one in London was never that. In yeah, fact, I was given bodyguards at the time. Was I was going to ask why it wasn't in there, but I suppose that sort of answers it. Ha it. it, happened, after the it happened after the movie. Um, but it was, and it was not, not planned. They were, 
that, that gender thing. And of course, everywhere I, you go, there's always someone with a camera and, and probably here. And, and so that thing where I walked out and said, I'm not going to lecture because women are segregated, that was someone got it on their camera and then it became when, and it actually, be, it, it turned out to be useful because it got used in England and it hit all the papers. And then University College banned that organization from University College. So I, I just viewed myself as doing God's work. It's really. <laughs> Well, if I could ask a different question, then yeah. if I may. <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, more of a general question on science in America. Um, with this attack that's been on science in America over the past decade or two decades, um, it's gotten a lot of people like myself, and my wife, and other people who, aren't ne who like science but weren't really involved or interested, like we wouldn't have flown down to come see this, uh -huh. um, into it. And so I'm curious on your thoughts whether you think this attack on science has been a bad thing, or actually a good thing if it's gotten a lot more people involved, right? You know, I, it's hard to, you know, you, it's, it's a hypothetical question, because you don't know what it'd be like otherwise. I will say that I think people's perceptions always are that it's worse than it ever was. And, and, and sometimes it is. My, one of the things I always remember, but my ex-wife would told, told me is, is, she'd always say, it's gonna get worse before it gets worse. And, um, <laughs> I don't know if she was talking about her. Anyway, um, but, uh, but I, I don't, I mean, the level of scientific Ill literacy hasn't changed that much in the, in the American public. I do think you're right that there's been more vocal attacks on science. And part of the reason, maybe what Richard said in the movie, that people are feeling insecure, that they're feeling that there's, a, and um, so it, uh, the good thing is that if it, gets it, if it gets people talking about it, that's a good thing and thinking about it. And one of the purposes of, doing, of having a movie like this was not to preach to the converted, was to get, have the, this shown to people who've never thought of these questions and just get discussions going. And one of the very pleasing things that we've had is when we've done test screenings is that people have told us afterwards that, that, you know, that they went out to dinner that night and to all they talked about was, and so to reach the people who never have thought about this question of science versus religion. And, um, and um, so that, I think, is really a useful thing. But at the same time, you know, the, 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 the other side of the coin is, and it didn't really make it into the movie, is that some peop how people think it's an important question. And people always ask me about this, and it's, it's not important. No scientists talk about God. I've been in physics meetings for 35 years, probably, since I've been a physicist. I've never heard the word God mentioned once. As my friend Steven Weinberg, who's a well-known Nobel Prize winning physicist and an atheist as well, said, most scientists don't even think enough about God to know if they're atheists. It's just irrelevant. We make it seem as if it's a pressing issue, and it's pressing in public, but it's not pressing in the scientific community. It's just never discussed. Um, two things. First, uh, because of all the exposure that you've had in the media and all the hatred that there is in this country about religion, uh, with religion against science, and living in, in a state like Arizona, in this country, the Second Amendment country, have you ever been concerned, you and all the other about our safety? Is about that safety, how have you, I don't know, we're in your uh, safety, I don't know. Uh, I try not to think, yeah. We've, we've had, at the Reason Rally, we had a, there was a, a death threat and we had a, a um, large bodyguard who you can, if you watch the movie again, you'll he gets see. It's right in the shot. But the difference between a physicist and a biologist, a physicist knows about cross sections. I stood behind the bodyguard, <laughs> Richard stood in front of the bodyguard, so that's your, <laughs> tells you the difference. But, um, but, uh, but um, anyway, it was obvious the minute we got there in my, both our minds. I mean, it was just a f f wonderful feeling and it wouldn't worry about it. But the interesting place, the only places I've ever been, I, I haven't really felt worried ever, to tell you the truth, except maybe a, a little bit after I did that thing at, this, at the uh, Islamic event in London, which was, what I was gonna say is the only two places I've ever been assigned bodyguards personally was when I spoke to religious groups, which is interesting. Tells you something, doesn't it? In North Carolina once, and then in the Islamic thing in London. But the only time I really felt scared was afterwards, the people who were furious at me at that event in London for insisting it be not segregated were the women. The Islamic women, the people in bags. And, um, and they, and I, it was terrifying because you don't know what they have under those things. 
And they were looking at me with such hatred that I really, it's the only time in my life I've really been thought maybe someone would, you know, do something. But normally no, because, you know, I make jokes and it's fun and, you know, I, I don't feel, I, my wife worries about that a little bit now, and, and, but I, I just don't, I think it's, you can't worry about that. And I don't think, I, I, I'm not trying, I think I generally try to make, try to entertain people and try and get people excited rather than try and get people mad. And so I hope that that works. Lawrence, you should know that uh, Eddie Tabash is a black belt in karate. Great, so excellent. I'll I'm have him along with me. If something happens. Okay, excellent. Question here. Hi, Dr. Krauss. Thank you. I, I feel privileged to be here. You know, I'm from Louisiana, and you know, they're yeah. heavy on the Jesus down there. But uh, they'll they'll tend to, you know, they they accept a lot of science. What their doctor says. If they're sick, they'll get the treatment, the medication. They'll vaccinate their kids. Then you come here, and they're not religious. And you, I find. I run into a lot of, it's a distrust of science on like a daily level, almost kind of like uh, they're anti-religion, kind of like the Bill Maher types, but traditional Chinese medicine, homeopathy, yeah. acupuncture, crystals, and, and what, what's, how do you, do you have any thoughts on, on that? Like reason does not follow this well, unbelief. It's something I've, I've always tried to explain to Richard, because he, he lives in Oxford. And he doesn't realize what the rest of the world is like sometimes. <laughs> and and um, that human beings aren't rational. No one is, even scientists. I mean, everyone has to believe 10 impossible things before breakfast just to get up. We all rationalize. We all. And so it is disappointing when the so-called skeptical community or the so-called whatever free thinking community ha has the same kind of religious beliefs but about other n nonsense. And so it's really important, I think, that we need to point that out as well and not you know not suggest that this that 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 just because people you know are, are label themselves something that that that's okay we constantly have to question ourselves and everyone else and make fun of the things that are stupid and um uh and and so you're right it's really frustrating to see people who are the whole hearts are in the right place and and, and say things that are reasonable in one case like Bill Maher, say things, stupid things, and I've been on his show and, 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 and uh, talked to him a little bit about it. And um, I think we, it's just incumbent on us, those of us who have a microphone and a voice, it, it, to try and ridicule everyone equally. And, and that's basically it. What do you think about the new show Cosmos on Fox? <laughs> okay, I've said that a lot. Um, well, first of all, I don't have a TV. So... Um, uh, I, I haven't seen it, but I know a lot about it. And I know Neil very well, and I, and I know, and I was involved with Andy Drian early on. In fact, it's a long story, but I almost did co Cosmos, but I, ha I didn't. Um, and I think, um, uh, from what I hear and from a lot of people who have seen it, that it, 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 I wrote a, a piece in the New Yorker about it, um, which saying that I thought it wouldn't ever achieve what Carl Sagan's did for a variety of reasons, and and, and I don't need. I, I don't need to go into all of that here. But um, that I was worried about the graphics, that it would be overuse of graphics, because nowadays what frustrates me about science on TV is it's just graphics up the wazoo. And um, to me, if you want to really see good science on TV, go see Jacob Bernowski, see The Ascent of Man, where it's a guy just talking to the camera, but what he says is so interesting that you can't take your eyes off him instead of all this stuff. And I think nowadays, we have this Sesame Street generation of kids who just are used, they can't listen. They just have to see all this stuff. But at the same time, I think it's really great that it's been done, and I think we all have to support it. It's really fantastic that you can get a 13-part series on a major network. And so my hope is that that is a success, because then it'll allow more science on TV. Because what's amazing is we fill up Gamage. You saw, we fill up 3,000 people each time we do an event. People are fascinated by science, but the TV producers, have no, they're just idiots. They think the TV will that science will turn people off. They don't realize there is an audience. So my hope is that there's an audience for this, and that'll allow us to do other, other TV, and I could do programs with these guys. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask your opinion. Um, when you compare America to some of the other more developed countries that are westernized, um, <laughs> what is it do you think about American or, or the American public um, that's really different to why we 
tend to cling to religious ideology so much to where we're trying to you know, enforce it in our classrooms. And mm -hmm. what, what's the difference? <laughs> well, you know, when we, we, we just got asked, you know, every, and remember in Prague, we get out, we, oh, everyone over, we're anywhere else in the world, they say, what's the difference between audiences here and American audiences? And frankly, there's not much at all. There, 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 there are people, well, of course, of course it's self-selecting, the audiences who come to the movie. There's usually uh, one religious guy in, in every country who asks an angry question. But I think, I'll tell you something interesting that, that uh, one of the, the United States is a quote, more religious country than, than you know, the Czech Republic is like 80% atheist or something. And one of the most interesting theories that I've read about this, and it's not my own, but I think it's fascinating as a historian, is that the reason religion is so successful in the US is that we don't have a state religion. You see, if you have a state religion like the Church of England, it gets lazy, you know, because it doesn't need, it gets government support, it doesn't need to do anything. But if you don't, you've got you've to you've be capitalists. You've got to go out and be entrepreneurs. You've got to be entrepreneurial. And you see these mega churches here because the way they survive is by, is by being entrepreneurial. And it's much more effective. Then this, the, and so you go, you know, you go to Rome, a Catholic country, but everything's open on Sunday. Okay, people just don't even worry about that. But here, because it's been so, in order to survive, it's had to be entrepreneurial. It's been much more effective at, at, at going into the, to the psyche of the country. And so we'd be better off if we had a state church. That's the first thing. The second thing I'm gonna say here for the second time, you guys were shocked when I said it in Czechoslovakia, and I was too, because I'd never said it in public. But it scares me. I mean, I grew up in Canada, so I, should, I've, I have this sort of inherent anti-Americanism that I sort of grew up with. Um, even though I was born in this country and I could be president. I just want to point that out. Um, but uh, um, unlike, what's his name in Texas? But anyway, um, I think Americans share with, with a lot of characteristics with the Germans before World War II. The Germans had this were really happy to be told that they were, that they were the, the superior race. And my feeling, unfortunately, is that Americans have this built-in feeling that somehow they're God's gift to humankind. And that is scary. And I think they, they're natu they grow up with that more than any other country I've seen. I mean, every country has ridiculous patriotism. But in this country, you grow up with this, somehow this notion that this is the shining pinnacle that was created for the whole world to see. And that makes you much more naturally susceptible to the notion that somehow God is, you're there because God wanted you to be there. I think it scares me. I want to hear more about your theory of survival of the fittest churches. You heard it. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I think that... Uh, yeah, you heard it's it. true. Tim can probably tell you, uh, Church of England puts people to sleep. Yeah, I mean they're kinder and gentler, you know. And and and, uh, and although Richards debated the the the, Arch the Archbishop of Canterbury several times, uh, various Archbishops of Canterbury, and um, they can be pretty effective because they're actually reasonable. Yeah. Okay. Question here. Thank you. Uh, thank you for coming, Dr. Krauss. I uh, want to say. Guys. And, and, <laughs> yeah. and to the entire team. Uh, I want to say that the, uh, the segment at the early part of the City Bible Forum debate oh. against William Lane Craig was some of the most precious video I've ever seen on YouTube. So thank you for that. Thank you for that. It was very difficult to do. It's very difficult to call someone a liar in front of 2,000 people. It's really difficult when you're on stage to know you're gonna lose half of the audience right away. But the reason I did that, those series of debates, because I did not want to promote that jackass, was to show, I said I'm gonna do it to show this guy's a liar. Because a lot of people don't, who think he's an, you know, that this is an honorable enterprise and an earnest. I'd, I'd actually debated him in North Carolina once. It was the event where I had to have um, bodyguards. Uh, it was for the, Campus Crusade for Christ at, at uh, North Carolina State. And I went into it naive. I thought this is some intellectual, honest guy, misguided maybe. I, we could have an honest intellectual discussion. And I got, I got completely sideswiped. I mean, he, he was there to lie and to do whatever was necessary. And I was shocked. And I, I felt like I really got taken for a ride. And so when I got asked to do that again, I said, first of all, I, first I said, 
I won't do it if you videotape it. I don't want to raise this guy's profile. Then, I'll, then I agreed, I'll allow one of them to be videotaped. Because I want people to see, that I'm going to go out, I'm going to show how this guy lies. And that's why I did it, but it was very difficult to do. And then of course what happens is they videotaped all three, and let it be known that they'd videotaped all three, and then if I didn't allow it, of course, it was like, what, what was, what's Professor Krauss censoring? So we allowed it all on there. And, but it's, it's hard to watch. It's hard for me to watch. I, you know. But, it, but I, I hope it had the effect that you say. Uh, you know, it's hard to know for sure, but... Um, it was brilliant. Well, thank you. It was brilliant. And, and my, my question was to, to tee up for you, if you'd, if you'd care to comment, on the extent to which William Lane Craig and other apologists of his ilk have, a, have an absolute knowledge that what they're doing is promoting their brand, protecting their brand, and earning a buck selling snake oil, or whether there's an element where they're just refusing to accept the very obvious evidence in contrary to what they're saying. I, I think it's a mixture of both. For most people, you know, most people, hard, it's hard, most people who go out and do things think they're doing the right thing. You know, and they convince themselves of that. And so, very few people say, you know, I'm going to go out and do something really rotten today. And so, there is lo no doubt that William Lane Craig is a snake oil salesman. I will say, however, after four events, three events with him, and we spent, you know, a couple of hours each night, you, you guys watch it too. I, 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 I think that he genuinely believes in what he's doing. But he's so blinded that not only does he not listen, and not only is he not willing to learn, but it doesn't seem wrong to him that he lies. So I think he's convinced himself that what he's doing is for God's greater glory of God. And so as a man, I don't think he's an evil man individually. What he's doing is evil, though, in my opinion. So. For those who don't know about the lies that he's actually quoting. Yeah, a lot of them about the movie. Yeah, well, yeah he, he, he went on record talking about the film. And three this, times. Well, yeah, three he, times, three podcasts. He did three half-hour podcasts about how horrible the movie was and uh, how it was full of all these lies. He essentially went line by line through the movie and just told lies about it. So we couldn't sit by, I mean, I don't know. Well, he'd never there. seen the movie. Never seen well, the we knew the movie <laughs> hadn't been shown. So yeah. he had a bootleg was, copy of. He didn't of, have a bootleg. Of, he didn't have a bootleg. He, he had an audio yeah. that one of the people in his group had yeah. had had taken, and he said things that were. But even even that, what he what he, he just distorted it, and we said, I said, I can't allow that to. If he's he's asking for it. Well, there's a video out there if anybody wants to watch it. I forgot what it's called, but yeah, yeah. we we, we show the parts of the film that he lies about, and then we show his lies. Yeah, we shows what he says, and it's just complete. Yeah. yeah so I thought. That's when I thought we got to show this. And then there was a, unfortunately, there was a, some great footage out there, which you should watch, which didn't make the debates. I tried to insert it, but it was just, there wasn't enough time, of some gr gr people who have made films of statements he's made about animal morality, and, and they're wonderful. You should really watch them. Do you remember the people who named who made them? But, I can't remember. But you could, you could find them on YouTube. They're really exceptionally good, and I, I tried to show a few um, uh, that really did, Line by line, he lies about what a scientist is saying, not just what I'm saying. And cosmology, what really pisses me off is he, is he lies about cosmology and pretends to know what he's talking about. And I thought, well, I'm going to take him to task on that. But he does the same thing for neuroscience and, and, and the science of animal consciousness. You know, of course, this question of why there's, why, you know, it, it, you can be cruel to animals. Well, that's okay, because animal, or why God doesn't you know, save animals. Well, animals don't have a soul because they're not conscious, they're not self-aware, they don't suffer. All these things. It was essential for him, in his belief, to believe that animals don't suffer. And therefore, any evidence that animals suffer, he will discount, even though the, his discounting is a complete lie. Okay, it's, yeah. it's fun to watch, or it's sickening to watch to me. Hi. Uh, I have a question for the filmmakers. Good. Uh, I was wondering, no. uh, if you had to, what would you say is the narrative, through-line, story of the film? Go ahead, Luke. <laughs> Um, well, uh, for me, I mean, it's just a different kind of documentary. I mean, we, maybe it's bad to say, but we made a movie because we don't really like documentaries. So it's a movie made by people that don't like documentaries. So we, we actually wanted to make it more of, we call it a rock and roll tour film about science. Because um, something that influenced this was 
the big show at Gamage, and it felt like more like a rock concert than uh, a lecture. And um, you know, when we said we want to go with you and be on the road and see what it's like, we saw that there was a lot of the same things that happened with a band that happened with with these guys. You know, you're flying to a location, you go in a cab, go to the venue, do your show, sign books, back to the hotel, back to the next thing. It's just da 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 da. And there was a don't forget the groupies. And groupies. <laughs> we cut all the groupies out. <laughs> so, uh, so for me, it was more of um, just kind of a personal story, a slice of time, and just seeing what it is like to be them and what they're doing and the people that they're reaching, rather than here's something that they should achieve and then at the end of the movie, do they achieve it or not? It just felt more like this is just a nice little piece of time. I mean, there is a narrative flow in the sense that, you know, we show them going out and how it culminates is you see what's happening in America. There is a change happening. Um, unfortunately, it wasn't covered very well on news, but, um, but, but you know, in spite of that, I mean, it, he's right. It, it's, it's, the flow is, it's, it's, we wanted to just show what it was like a day in the life of these guys. I mean, you know, I, I, we thought to ourselves, if somebody made a documentary of like Mark Twain or somebody that we loved, we really need to see pictures from their childhood and little things going on. We, we wanted to see what it was like to be them in this moment, in this moment where they are, you know, at the, you know, at the top of their game. Richard and Lawrence are out there changing the world, and and we wanted to capture that. And we just felt like, you know, we don't need a, we don't need a dialogue, we don't need a through line. It's it's it's, it's all just going to be fluff. We just wanted to show what was happening. Well, I do think there's an error of flaw. I mean, I'm watching it and obviously playing, you know, yeah. at, we consulted during it. There is a kind of, you know, the reason rally is a nice culmination of a, of a long trip. And then one of the things we did discuss, which, which I played a little role in, I guess, is the, is the last, who would be the, have the last word? And, and uh, I, I felt personally strongly that Bill Pullman should, that statement about are you really convincing anyone? Are you bashing brains? In? Because I, I thought it was a better way to leave it with that open question. You know, because this is what we do, but are we, is it achieving anything or not? I, I often wonder that. It's nice to hear people say things, but afterwards you wonder, are you really, make, are you really having an impact? And so, anyway. And, and, uh, it, the other thing I thought that was a good choice to do that is, you know, the last thing you see on the screen is for Christopher. Yeah. And I feel like leaving it with that little twist at the end is just a, a little bit of a gut punch like Christopher would have done. You know, just change it up a little bit, and I think that was a good choice. Are there any estimates about when the movie might be available for purchase? 2018. <laughs> we, we know Very exactly soon. when, but we're not allowed to We're not allowed to say that it'll be in June. Um, in we early definitely June. aren't allowed to say it. Yeah, we're not allowed but to say it'll be in early June at all, are we? Are we allowed no, to say that? we aren't. And no. that it'll be on iTunes and Amazon and, no, and then later on Netflix? No? No. Yeah. Oh, shoot. Okay. Xbox. <laughs> DVD. We're not allowed to, but he is. <laughs> so, we, hey, a, a, an announcement will be forthcoming within... Ten days. Ten days. Yeah. So, in ten days, there'll be an announcement. Now you're putting a clock on it. Yep. By chance, you alluded to the subject of my question. Um, you and, and Richard Dawkins and, and some of the people in the film are superstars to me and those of us that hang around CFI a lot. And, um, and I sort of thought that maybe this was our year, you know, that there's uh, the, your inner fish. You don't watch TV, but okay. There's the, I know, but I know Neil Shubin well. He's part of our... Yeah, yeah. Okay. And then the, the uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson yeah. Cosmos. Then now two skeptics... Well, this, the on, an honest liar uh -huh. movie is being uh, uh, shown in film festivals now. And now your film here. And I thought, this is our year. This is our year. And I'm my, the other thing that goes on in my mind is I know that we're hardwired for belief. And you said, okay, are we bashing our heads in? It, so well, can you address that again? Well, I, I, actually, I was thinking when Luke said, gave an answer once to something that made me think about that, because he's seen it. People, and it's not in the movie, and it would be nice. One of the things that would be maybe nice in the movie, although it seems a little self-serving, so I didn't want it to be there, is we hear, but every day I get letters and Richard gets letters from people who say that in one way or another what we're doing is change their lives. And so 
And it, it happens every single day. And so it really, it, is, it really is having an impact. And I think, um, and it's probably just as well it didn't, wasn't in the movie, but it's very satisfying. People write and apologize to me and say, I'm sorry, take your time. But for me, it's, it's, uh, it's just not only gratifying, it really makes you feel like it's worth doing this. And so I do think these kind of things are having an impact. And, um, and we just gotta try and do every, more of them. And that's why this is a, an experiment and, 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 and we'd like it to be successful because we wanna try doing more things. But, but I do think um, you, you, the, there's lots of evidence uh, th that indeed it's religious belief is monotonically going down, even in the United States. And, um, uh, and in fact, one of the, uh, I'll tell you one anecdote that isn't in the movie that Rich, uh, so in, the, in England, um, there was a recent census of, uh, they do censuses all the time, and, and you, they asked for religious beliefs, and 54% of the people said they were Christian, which was an all-time low, but still more than 50%. But what's interesting is what the Richard Dawkins Foundation did was go out and interview people who checked off the Christian box and say, well, do you believe this? Do you believe this? Do you believe in the transubstantiation? Do you believe in the virgin birth? Do you believe in... And no, 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 no. And they said, so why did you check the Christian box. And they said, well, we want to think of ourselves as good people. <laughs> and so it's interesting that even most of the people who check off those things have just been conned into thinking they have to check those boxes to say they're good people. So all we have to do is convince them they don't have to check the box and they can still be good people, and we've won. Thank you. How, how much long do you want to keep these people trapped here? I know Tim, Tim is shaking because he needs a drink. I'm going to keep looking at him. I'm, uh, <laughs> We're going to do three more questions. Okay. Hi. Uh, there, was, there was a part in the film where you and uh, Richard were talking about how we evolved during the, you know, in Africa, and so we understand just those time scales and, and those sizes. But at the same time, we, we have acquired through science a very good idea of the small and the large. And my question is, you know, with technology, you know, there's a limit and then we have new technology and we learn something more. Do you think that there is a limit to our understanding and will we ever know that limit or will technology just keep propelling us forward? Well, that's a good question, which again, I've been asked, but I think the answer is we don't know. We don't, that's the big, what pisses me off is when people say, you'll never know this. Because how do you know till you try? There are undoubtedly limits to what we can know about the universe, but we don't know what those limits are until we push them. And, and in fact, there are things I would have thought we would never have been able to probe about the universe when I was a graduate student, or maybe even 10 years ago, that we can do now. I've just written, you know, some of the work I've done in gravitational waves is, it's amazing to me that we may probe the universe at the millionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second after the Big Bang. But there are limits. You know, for example, we probably can't see before the Big Bang. We're, there are limits to the fact that we're living 13.7 billion years after the Big Bang and that in a lo location that limits what we can empirically learn about the universe. We can't see beyond our horizon. And, and we never will be able to, it looks like. And so there are empirical limits to what we can say about the universe. And we're getting close to them in my field, which is really amazing. It's the first time we've had to worry about that. But we're nowhere near the limits of science. We're nowhere near it in general. And even those empirical limits might not put limits. So we may even be able to learn about other universes even without being able to detect them directly, which I'd be happy to talk to you about sometime. Uh, and I'm probably going to write about it. Um, and so the bottom line is you just don't know what the limits are until you try. And what's really interesting is that science has not yet come up against those limits. We always, it keeps progressing by little baby steps. And Richard Feynman, who I wrote a book about, said, you know, I don't, some, there was a big talk, that used to be talk about a theory of everything, and it was kind of, I still think it's kind of nonsense. And he said, I don't care, I don't want to know everything. And, and my friend Frank Wilczek, who's a Nobel Prize winner, says, I don't want a theory of everything, I just want a theory of something. <laughs> and, uh, but, but what Richard said was, well, maybe the universe is like an onion, you know, and every time you just peel back a layer, there's more, you know, there are more thing, questions and more things to need, know, and you'll never know it all. But who cares, we just want to learn a little bit more, and that's what science is all about, is every day learning to understand the universe a little bit better, because ultimately, it helps us understand ourselves a little bit better. Okay, in the way back. Uh, thank you very much uh, for coming out and showing the movie. Um, I, I want to comment on what you were just talking about, the, uh, 
the limits of science. I think it was Neil deGrasse Tyson that said that if our knowledge of science is a circle, the bigger it gets, then the, the radius of ignorance gets bigger also as we acquire more knowledge. Well, the uh, questions, every, every time we learn something, the question, we get new questions. That's great. Uh, but my question is for the filmmakers. Um, did you, you mentioned that you interviewed some artists, you mentioned Cameron Diaz specifically, to kind of give that connection with mainstream society. Did you consider or did you approach any athletes uh, along the same lines to give that connection with uh, a different segment of society? Uh, one that comes to mind would be, uh, I don't know if you've heard of Chris Cluey, who got released by the Minnesota Vikings for voicing his opinion on, on gay marriage. To be honest, the only person we attempted to approach was, um, what's his name, Emily's boss? David Beckham. David Beckham. Dave, oh yeah, David Beckham. Because he's right. a friend of the family. Yeah. <laughs> we, we thought, and actually, you know, we could have. Um, and afterwards, I've been actually gotten letters from a number of really amazing pro, uh, professional hockey players who I didn't think had a brain. And, uh, and, um, and uh, I'm sorry, I grew up in Canada, I'm allowed to say that, okay? Because um, I know a lot of hockey players. Anyway, um, but I, I was amazed. I get these letters saying, there are more of us out there than you think. We can't voice our opinions. But we're, you know, and I was really taken by that when, when they wrote to me. I, um, I think, uh, you know, if you ask me personally, and this is a bias, I think we didn't do it because I don't think athletes should be role models. There are too many, there are too many in this country, again, growing up in a different country, you see these this country is crazy about athletics and a university, as working in a university, I see universities as being farm teams for professional sports. And it's not that case any other, where, any other place in the world as far as I know. So I guess I'm, I wasn't particularly eager necessarily to raise that, but it would have been, it might have been a good idea. You're right. I, I it, think. it probably would have been, but just truthfully, uh, we don't know many. We're just not very big sports uh, it, people. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, just a matter of who you know. We got yeah. the people we knew or people we had connections with. Yeah. And, um, and you tried, David Beckham. Yeah. I tried. I have a quick question for you. Yeah? Why aren't you wearing Converse anymore? Oh, because you are. No. Um, n uh, I w today, my feet were hurting, and I wanted to try these new shoes I just bought. So I, um, But I also, in deference to all of you, I'm not wearing Converse because now there's this expectation that I wear a different <laughs> Converse pair of shoes. And I tend to think of it as a, as a costume. And so when I'm giving a lecture, I wear a costume. But this is a group of friends, and I'm not, I'm not in costume. <laughs> OK, last question on the aisle here. Um, uh, at what point uh, in your odyssey did you become irreverent about religion? My aisle? Yeah. Well, I, be I guess I, I became irreverent about everything. I, I, I um, it was just growing, like anyone, I grew up, I was actually brought up in a Jewish household. I was bar mitzvahed, which made me anti-Semitic for a little while. And, um, and then uh, uh, I, I, read every, I read a tremendous amount when I was young. I mean, I read everything. So I read the Bible, I read the Koran, I read lots of things. And it was just a matter of, and, and first I wondered if it might be true, and you'd sort of want it to be, and, you, and, and then it's just like growing up. I didn't believe in Santa Claus, and I just grew up, and, and it just seemed less likely. And then... And then, um, and then as I became a scientist, or become more knowledgeable of science, the obvious fact that the universe ha had no evidence of purpose just became clearer and clearer. And um, so, it, like many things, it just grew. It wasn't, there was not one of these aha moments. It was just a matter of, of giving up childish things. Oh yeah, these guys came from a really religious family. We're both Jehovah's Witnesses. <laughs> Yes, they'll be coming to you Seriously? afterwards. Seriously? No, 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 but they, you want to tell them about your family? Uh, we do. We have an extremely religious family and... Good. We have a very religious family. Yeah, <laughs> they're, they're missionaries in other states uh, or countries and... Uh, and uh, That's true. Yeah, the, the best part of this entire experience, yeah. well, other than being able to be on stage with Lawrence and Richard from time to time, uh, which everyone should make a documentary about the heroes, <laughs> it's the best thing. Um, the best part was showing the movie to our family for the first time. Yeah. Yeah, and they came to they came to a screening. They did come to a screening. Yeah, and we, we asked them what they thought, and they sat for a little while, and they 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 dried off their tears, and then they said uh, the photography was really good. <laughs> <laughs> but it's wonderful. It's wonderful that they came. Yeah, and yeah. and I think that's a one. And in fact, 
they, I, I don't. I thought one of them said the same thing that that they would mo want to encourage their friends to see it. Right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we did a we did a test screening poll, at one of, and it the uh, the people who were the most religious at our test screenings, and my family was among these, uh, clicked off the box and said I would be most likely to uh, recommend this film to other people, and um, so that was very encouraging. It was very nice. Well, how did you to lose your belief? Or, you know, what was that? Um, I don't have a good story. I yeah, just, it just kind of faded. Really. Yeah, I just Nothing moved out of the exciting. house, and then we stopped kind of going and being indoctrinated every week. So it just kind of like yeah. wasn't important. Yeah, started reading books by these guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much thank for, you guys for, for, for coming. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Bob. Um, one last comment, and this is to address something that Wendy said. You're not bashing your head against the wall. We're making gains. Uh, even Sunday, we're having a lecture here by this guy, Phil Zuckerman, from Pitzer College, talking about the rise of the nuns. That's most of the people in this room. 20-some 20 percent, percent of Americans do not consider themselves part of any religion. A third of young people. This is on the rise. Somebody like you is having an effect. So thank you for your work.